unlike a lot of people that you may have on this podcast, I actually don't care about language learning. I, do, I am not passionate about learning languages. I am passionate about... Hey guys, welcome back to the Kodakata Podcast. So this week we talked to Benny Lewis, which was an absolute honor. And it was really amazing to hear about his entire journey, learning languages, and his personal growth and development. But as always, remember, we need you. This is an absolute requirement, but we need you to destroy the like button. I, I don't think we've been as assertive as we needed to be, right, Eric? Because yeah. I still see a like button there, and it's it's kind of... It sh- it sh- I don't think it should be there. Yeah, it should just disappear. Yeah. In theory. But, um, <laughs> In theory, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, it was crazy talking to Benny Lewis because he's kind of been like missing it in the in the language learning community for a while. Yeah. I mean, especially yeah, like, being such a big figure. I mean, sure, he's had some memes here and there, but I mean, yeah. he's had a lot of success too, and he's been doing this for so long, and having him come on our podcast, that was something else. I wasn't, yeah. like, I wasn't expecting that at all. Yeah, I mean, like, he's kind of like a, uh, he became kind of like a meme in the Japanese learning community, but honestly, like, when I first started learning Japanese, it was really inspiring to, like, hear, um, like his TED talks and also read his blog post on Tim Ferriss's podcast, like uh, his blog. So I was like following his thing, but it was really good to hear about his like entire like journey with learning Japanese specifically and like what worked in that case and like what didn't work and how he was able to like um, take that and learn like Mandarin to, to a higher level, for example. I mean, yeah, that, I yeah, think that... Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, but... I, I, <laughs> Yeah, but anyways, um, hope you guys enjoyed this conversation as much as we did, and hope it inspires you in your language learning as well. So let us know in the comments what you thought of the podcast, but hope you guys enjoy. All right, so Benny, can you give us a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? So I am Benny from Ireland. I have a degree in electronic engineering. When I was in school, I took uh, German for five years and the Irish language for 10 years, and I did miserably with both of them. I always thought that um, there was this language gene and that, like maybe it's a left brain, right brain thing. And I was a tech guy. I was good at mathematics and technology. I'm bad at the arts and languages. And that's what I uh, told myself until I got into my 20s. And I moved to Spain after I graduated and I lived there for six entire months and I did not learn any Spanish because like many expats, I just gravitated to the English-speaking community. And uh, what started to convince me was I was part of this exchange program with other engineers, and they were arriving with uh, the same lack of Spanish that I was. And with time, they actually started to get better and better at Spanish. And it really challenged this idea I had that maybe engineers can't learn a language. And from there, I had my first true attempt to learn a language, which was Spanish. And I managed to succeed with that after a while. And um, from there, I continued traveling. That was in 2003. So uh, for uh, like about 18 years, I have been on the road learning languages. And um, that's been the theme of my travels. And of course, I started Fluent in Three Months to document my language learning uh, story so I could share that with other people. And that's uh, grown since I started it. I've uh, published a bunch of books. I've worked with National Geographic. I've given TEDx talks that you guys were just saying you saw. Um, But mainly what I'm trying to do with everything is to inspire other people who feel like they don't have the language gene and to really squash that myth that uh, languages are for language people. I do not consider myself a language person, even though I do this for a living. And yet I have managed to break through this barrier. And that's uh, what I try to inspire other people to do as well. Yeah, that's uh, super inspiring to hear. But um, I guess a lot of our listeners are probably really interested in uh, the method that you use specifically to learn languages. Because uh, fluent in three months, a lot of people would think that's something that's not possible or even to get to a uh, like a base level, especially for Asian languages. But could you describe like what... Um, what that method is and how you how you uh, developed it. Yeah, so the the concept of fluent in three months definitely has a lot of controversy with it. And I think when I first interacted with the online language community, 
there was a, a very big misalignment with what we understood as language learning. And I think I have interacted with a lot more people from a wider scope of language learning over the years. And I think that for most people, fluency in three months is just not going to be realistic because they're learning a language uh, part time. It's something that maybe someday they would like to be able to do. And it's not practical to do that in a short burst of time. Now, on the other hand, I came from an experience where I was trying to live in the country and avoid using the language. So that that level of necessity changes things quite a lot that I have to learn this language within a certain time span or I'm just not going to have any friends. I'm not going to be able to interact with people. So that's really reframed it, that learning the language was my full time job. And for a lot of my intensive projects, I've generally put over eight hours a day and lived and breathed the, the language and completely avoided using English. And that changes what's possible. And um, from there, like I for me, fluency means social equivalency. So very specifically, if any of your readers or listeners are used to the European Common Framework, that B2 level, where essentially you could go to a pub and someone could talk to you at regular speed about most commonly discussed uh, things in your life. And you can have that conversation with them. They can talk with one another and speak at regular speed. And that for me is the beginnings of fluency. You can go on into the advanced C levels and that's where you start to talk about more technical subjects. So I've got a C2 diploma and I've studied this for the C2 exam in several of my languages and what that means is i can work as an electronic engineer in those languages and that's impressive and that's amazing but ultimately uh, realistically at least for me and for a lot of people i'm uh, i tend to talk with uh, when it comes to languages uh, they want to be able to interact with people so that's where the the concept of like how can you do this quickly comes in and the core of my approach is speak from day one. The biggest mistake that I made in that Spanish project that I said that I failed at for six months was I had this idea in mind that if I study enough Spanish, eventually I'll have this eureka moment and I'll suddenly be able to speak Spanish. Once I've learned enough conjugations or I've uh, crammed enough vocabulary into my brain, then I will be ready. And like the analogy I, I like to give people is this is a effectively like imagining you wanted to learn how to ride a bike and the way you did that was by studying aerodynamics and the, you never put you never put your ass on an actual saddle because you're convinced you know if i if i just watch youtube videos of bmx experts doing loop the loops then i'll be able to like ride my bike um a few meters down the road and of course that's not how it works you have to get on the bike you have to fall you have to build up that muscle memory of actually trying to use it and it's going to suck. And this is a, the thing about, I, I always tell people, I do not have the easy way to learn the language. The hard way is you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have to learn uh, in front of somebody. It's There's going to be embarrassing moments, but you get that out of your system and you push through it. And this approach of speak from day one has completely transformed my language learning experience and it's what the theme of the beginning stages are for me the later stages tend to be for me at least are pretty standard and traditional i would do very academic things to improve my reading skills to polish my grammar but the way i get momentum in the language initially is by speaking it from the absolute beginning no matter how bad i am no matter how few words i know and that's something I've implemented for every language project ever since then. Right. Yeah, I think I think anybody who's reached fluency in a foreign language knows that to be the case. Like we were talking about this with a with another guest, but it's kind of like how for programming, it's really comforting to maybe just take courses and courses and not actually get real experience. And but if you really want to learn, you have to like go and like be uncomfortable and figure out how things work. And I think it's the same for for languages. But I was curious, like, did you did you develop this method at all, like, with from an engineering perspective? Because I know you interviewed Tim Ferriss, and he talks about like, uh, like the eighty twenty principle of how he learned like twenty percent of the top most used kanji, and that 
allowed him to read 80% of most material. Like, did you incorporate any like engineering principles in, in your method? Absolutely. And the thing that separates engineers from scientists is that if you're a scientist and you're studying the likes of physics, then you can make uh, these uh, perfectionist assumptions that there's no wind resistance or whatever if you're making a bridge. In the real world, that doesn't exist. Engineers have to deal with imperfection. And if an engineer waited until all conditions were perfect, we would not have any technology and there'd be no advances whatsoever. You have to accept the world is imperfect. So this has been the core of my philosophy that I really fight perfectionism. And it's why when I'm getting into a language, I tell people that ultimately my goal on a day to day basis is can I make at least 200 mistakes this day? And that's very counterintuitive because a lot of people are like, no, my goal is I'm supposed to speak the language perfectly. I can't make mistakes. But the problem is, if you're a learner, you have to make mistakes. You have to speak and speak incorrectly. Your pronunciation isn't going to be great. You're maybe going to use an incorrect word. The world does not open up and swallow you whole and send you to hell if you make a little mistake. You just have to try. It's really at this stage, I've learned to just accept this feeling that at the start, I'm going to sound a little bit like Tarzan if I'm speaking whatever language that is and work through that. And I do get better and better with practice. Practice is so important. And with language learnings for so many people, they may practice like aspects of the language, like they may practice reviewing vocabulary and practice exercises, but they're not actually practicing using the language. And like a a good analogy somebody told me recently is if you imagine children and reading, what what, what happens in the first years of a child's life is first they learn to read and then they read to learn. And this is the way I like to think of languages is at first I'm learning this language, but as soon as possible, I want to use that language in truly live, actual situations like trying to make a new friend or watching a TV show or uh, even flicking through TikTok and just trying to get content in the language that way. The ways that I would naturally use it in, I would naturally use my mother tongue. I try to make the language become a tool for me. And as an engineer, I have never put languages on a pedestal. And it's why, like, unlike a lot of people that you may have on this podcast, I actually don't care about language learning. I, do, I am not passionate about learning languages. I am passionate about other cultures. I am passionate about making friends from around the world. And because of that, the language is a tool. The language is just a screwdriver for me to to unlock, um, you know, a, the, no, that analogy has, has lost me. The screwdriver is going to use a door. But you, you know what I mean? It's it's a tool to, to open your door to another uh, another culture. And because of that, it's OK It's if it's imperfect. So that engineering mindset has absolutely come through. And like you said, the. Uh, with Tim Ferriss, I, I have um, a similar mindset to the uh, Pareto principle where the 20% gives you the 80%. So people who who would like say, well, you're not fluent in the language unless you know the word shoelace in the language. And I'm like, well, when, when are you going to say shoelace? Like, yeah, sure. Later on in the language, it is important to make sure you're filling in those final gaps. But as a beginner, yeah, I'm very specific that there are a certain amount of conversations I'm likely to have. And if I'm uh, having lots of conversations on Skype with a, a teacher online, or if I'm living in the country and I'm starting to socialize, those are pretty predictable conversations where I'm maybe talking about myself and I'm asking them about themselves. And I want to know the kind of words they tend to talk about. I don't need to be prepared for an epistemological debate on Kantian philosophy. That does not need to happen at the drop of a hat. If it happens, I'll say, I'm sorry, I'm not ready for that conversation. But generally, it doesn't tend to happen. So that is a more practical way of deciding. I There's a certain amount of vocabulary that is essential. I'll focus on that. And I'm not going to care so much about the words that maybe come up. And I'm going to, if I have to... Uh, piece together using the words I do know to describe 
the thing that I don't know yet. Uh, if I don't know the word for car, I mean, that's a very basic word. If I don't know that, I'd say, oh, the thing with four wheels. And just by saying the thing with four, it, it gets you set up to be able to expand the little that you have further. And and like I said, I try to have a dynamic learning approach. So everything I've been talking about gets very messy when you get into the advanced stages that, you know, you don't want to be having uh, all these gaps in your language. You don't want to be making these mistakes, but you have to have at the beginning stages uh, a bigger um bigger space in your life for making these mistakes because that will give you progress way faster so you get to that intermediate stage ready to polish things up and really get in on the difficult words and grammar and so on yeah i think that's a a really cool perspective and also fresh perspective of of uh, how you're interested in the culture and then as a result you learn the language but um i think a lot of our listeners they they mostly know you from uh, your, you had a very famous challenge of trying to learn Japanese in a very short period of time. And so can you share like some, some background about that challenge and maybe like share like what worked for that challenge and what didn't work? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I have successful and unsuccessful projects all the time. And Japanese was among my less successful projects, but I did at least in the two months and people are welcome to see that I put my money where my mouth is and I from day one would speak and you can see videos of me sharing my conversations on Skype at the start they're cringeworthy if you speak Japanese very well uh, but if you're an absolute beginner then you see somebody try to speak that language and I'm very proud of the fact that I did in those two months push my Japanese to at least that basic conversational level and like that was by simply speaking it all the time and I had to make uh, I, I had to make a few adjustments. So um, when it comes to both Chinese and Japanese, um, because I I know that reading is not going to be central to my initial project of speaking. This means that learning kanji, or in the case of Chinese, learning Hansa, this is not a priority for me. And so I said that from the absolute start that all the vocabulary that I was putting into my flashcard decks. Those were going to be presented in um, hiragana, katakana only. So I'd learn those because they're they're not that hard to learn in a short amount of time. But I only need the phonetic equivalent sounds of the language because I don't plan to read it right now. Doesn't mean I'll never plan to read it. But to be practical, if you have a spoken focus, that's what you need to make of it. So at the at the two month point point, I reached that stage where I could have basic conversations with a patient speaker definitely not fluent because like i said before fluent levels they need to be able to talk naturally to you um and the mistakes i made in that project i think uh part of them were uh, personal life challenges that i had but in general it's i w- i didn't really have a good idea of what i was going to do in japan so i did end up going to japan but it was mostly just a touristy trip I, I didn't have a truly full level of immersion that i feel like i've had in so many other countries so the uh the big and i'm sure so many of your guests say this the big why of w- of the reason behind what you're doing this needs to be there and for me a big why a big motivating factor in a lot of my projects is i'm going to go to that country spend considerable time there and i'm going to make friends in that country at the time I was traveling with an English speaking partner and that completely changed my dynamic as I was going to go to the country that I knew I was going to spend more time with her and not necessarily immersing immersing myself in the culture. So that kind of took a lot of that um, pressure that I need to be there off me. Uh, so that that's part of the uh, part of the problem. But ultimately, like. Uh, people would always say, well, you know, Asian languages in particular are going to be harder. And absolutely, that that's there, there's no doubt about it. There's less common vocabulary and so on. But for me, this whole concept, it, I consider it to be useless. It's nothing more than mental masturbation. Just deciding, do you know what? My language is the hardest language. And it's it's more of an ego thing. It's like, I've learned Japanese, you haven't. And I put this work in and I want you to know how hard Japanese is because of that. But the thing is, I've heard this line over and over again. I've heard, 
Hungarian is the hardest language. French is the hardest language. Arabic is the hardest language. Chinese is the hardest language. Japanese is the I've just every single time. And it all comes from a, pr- a place of ego and pride. It's not ne- like um, I wrote this very detailed article where um, I was trying to address concerns someone had about why Chinese is the hardest language in the world. And the guy who wrote the article had not actually ever truly learned any other language. So he was making this bold assumption without any experience of other languages. And the thing is, learning languages is difficult. It definitely has that aspect of adjusting to like these brand new sounds. I have to understand what they mean and I have to try to produce sounds myself. That is an adjustment. But because of that, like um, it's uh, I wouldn't have said that like Japanese in particular had aspects of the language that slowed me down from the getting into that beginning speaking stage. Obviously, there's advanced aspects of Japanese that I don't know anything about that I can't speak to, but it, it definitely did not fit an exception to the rule of speak from day one. And I'm pretty happy with that basic conversational level I reached in two months because so many people will put years into learning a language like Japanese and not get to that level. And I did not get to that level because I'm smarter than them. I really emphasize this to people. I do not have any innate language uh, talent. I just embrace sounding like an idiot and I'm okay with that. And that helps me push through it. And uh, because that I got to that stage and I definitely plan to um, I'm back into a mode right now where I can travel solo again. And I definitely plan to return to Japanese at some stage. I'll share that uh, project with people when it comes around to it. I'll try and uh, aim high. And do you know what? Maybe I failed. But the thing is, if you aim as high as possible and really push yourself, that's how you know you're going to drive yourself forward. I feel too many people have very vague ideas of, you know, like New Year's is coming around and people will say, oh, I'm making a New Year's resolution. I want to speak Japanese. And they don't, that doesn't mean anything. Like what you need to have your, um, your, your basic smart objectives, you know, specific, measurable, all those things. And that's where my concept of fluent in three months comes from is I know what fluency means. I know what three months means. I have these very specific ideas in mind. I'm going to push myself as much as possible. If I fall short of that, it was intentionally as um, as ambitious as possible so that falling short of it still lands me somewhere very useful to be able to get to know that culture. Yeah, and I, I guess going towards the sound aspect that you mentioned briefly, how would you say sounding in a language? Because accents and pitch across various languages are de- definitely essential or vital to, I guess, fluency toward in, in, a, in a definition, right? So I guess for your fluent in three months or purely your definition of fluency, where would you say the pitch kind of goes into that and how you approach that angle? Yeah, it's it's a very interesting concept and I put, a, I put considerable time into learning like the musicality of several languages that I have taken on. Um, but realistically, I do not think that's a good use of people's time when they're just about reaching the beginning stages of fluency, because yes, you're going to have an accent and you just need to get over that. So many people are so obsessed with the fact that I need to sound like a Japanese native speaker that they're losing sight of what they could potentially still do with an accent. Even though you have an accent, you could still make friends. You could still have a rich life in the country. Now, when I'm at the advanced stages in a language, this is something I've done with with my top languages. So, for instance, with my Portuguese, um, I had a project and I blogged about this where I wanted by the end of my project to potentially make actual Brazilians think that I was Brazilian. And the great thing about Brazil is you have every ethnicity there. So the fact that I was a white guy, you don't have that challenge that I would have in Japan to obviously take one look at me. I'm clearly not Japanese, you know. Um, But the way I did it was I got singing lessons. And a a language teacher can be very, very smart about all those information points about how the grammar is, expressions, all that. But generally, language teachers 
are lacking in these truly phonetic understandings of how to express how their language sounds. So, like, she was teaching me that in Germanic languages like English, we separate our words like this. But when you're speaking Portuguese from Brazil, you gotta go up and down all the time and speak through your nose. And she got me to do this consistently so that I really got that accent down. And um, the, the pitch, the tonality, all of these things are so crucial if you want to sound like a native speaker. But that's not essential until you're at that stage. My Portuguese is at a sea level stage. I've learned plenty of it. I've had so many experiences. I've given talks in Portuguese. So it's at the level where I'm I'm ready and I'm able to move on to that. Whereas in the intermediate stages, it's just not a good use of my time. Because the, the goal is, can I have a, a smooth, can I have smooth communication with this person? And I want that communication to be as smooth as possible. That needs to be your priority. And this is all coming back to the Pareto principle. What are the 20% of the things that are going to give you 80% of the results? And working on your pitch and your intonation and your pronunciation is not something that belongs in that 20% when you're an intermediate level speaker. And this is a, a tough pill to swallow because people hate having an accent. And it's just, it's just part of the game. And I just accept as an intermediate level speaker, I have to have an accent. I'll get around to, if I push this language into the advanced stages, I'll get around to all those other things. And if I do get around to them, then I would generally work with somebody with a bit of a musical background and they would train me to have that particular accent in um, in essence that, you know, I now with the likes of my Spanish, for instance, I can switch between uh, European Spanish and Argentine Spanish and most recently uh, Mexican Spanish intonation and like sound to the language. I wouldn't necessarily say they would think I'm a native speaker in those languages like I achieved in Portuguese, but it definitely has uh, changed my experience with those people that they feel like I'm one of their group. It mm. does make a difference when you're ready to make that difference. The people's mentality about you changes. They don't think of you as the foreigner as much and they invite you to different things. It works on a subconscious level but it's only useful when you're already at the advanced stage in the language. Yeah, I think it also kind of depends, though, on the language itself. Like, I know, for example, like, um, for Japanese, there's pitch accent, but it's not really super important for communication because all the prefectures have different pitch accents, so people can still understand you if you have wrong pitch accent. But, for example, um, for Chinese, if you don't have at least, like, 60% accuracy with tones, it's it's pretty hard to understand what, what you're trying to say, right? Absolutely. And this this is why I say you have to uh, like come back to that Pareto principle and ultimately getting your tones wrong, the, this completely messes up your communication. So when I talk about tonality, I mean languages where that's more a nice to have thing. Whereas the tones in, in Mandarin, those those are essential. So like in I I thought initially with my Mandarin project, which was more of a success than my Japanese one, I thought do you know what? Maybe I can put off the tones and people might still understand me. At first, I thought that and it was a complete disaster. And even if I was sure I was saying the words, uh, my tones were all crazy all over the place. So I had to dedicate uh, like two full weeks where my only priority was tones. I wasn't really learning that much extra vocabulary. I wasn't, get, wasn't getting a lot of spoken practice. I was drilling can I say these tones correctly individually? Can I say them in a sentence correctly? Can I take these online listening exercises and hear the word and be like, is that the first tone, the second tone, or whatever it is? And when it's something that truly makes a difference for communication, obviously that brings it way more to the for forefront. What I was saying before is more like getting to the stage of where you want to sound like a native speaker in ways that doesn't actually make a difference for your ability to communicate but absolutely what you said like if if uh the pitch and the tone is a crucial aspect of basic communication that has to then uh come to the forefront so i've i i did work on that with mandarin and mm -hmm. i i always tell people with the tones there are analogies like people say oh i'm tone deaf 
I, I, I always try to fight these, um, these like mentalities with people. The tone deafness is an actual condition that some people have, and they use that to, well, you know, I can't sing karaoke. That is not the same thing as not being able to say tones in Mandarin, because if you yeah. understand the difference between, you know, uh, you are okay and you're okay, and uh, these like very basic question tonalities we have in English, if you understand that difference, obviously you're not tone deaf in a way that matters for learning a language like like Mandarin. So yeah. pe people have a lot of reasons why they may say, well, I don't have that knack. And I, I would I would always argue against that. I'd say, of course, you can find evidence that you why well, you don't have that knack. It's like uh, Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. And so I think like anyone listening to this, if they if they have like retorts like, yeah, but this is the reason why I am destined to fail. You know, it's not like I can argue against that. But I think that if you embrace these things, it truly just becomes your reality. And it's why I've always tried to find, do you know what? What are the reasons why I could argue that Japanese is easy? And this this is a very difficult thing in the online language community because, like I said, there's an ego part of it that you want. If you've achieved the language, you want other people to think you've achieved this very hard thing. And, and I understand that. But at the same time, as a beginner learner, that is completely useless to me. I don't I don't care why you think the language is is hard. I want to know what are the ways I can advance quickly and those ways involve discussing why the language is actually easy. There's a long list of reasons why a language like Japanese which doesn't have the tones of Chinese, it doesn't have a lot of features of of Germanic and Slavic languages that make those especially hard. It doesn't have the future subjunctive like Portuguese there's a lot of things it just doesn't have. But of course, you can say, yeah, but it does have this. It does have that. And I'm like, yeah, I, fine. You're you're not wrong. But that is not useful if you're trying to be motivated. And uh, like I do, I do learn these things that are hard, but I don't try to get them to bog me down because the me your mentality is so important when it comes to language learning. You need to see what is going to inspire me because that motivation, if that runs dry, then it doesn't matter if you have the best learning technique in the world, the best apps or like thousands of dollars of, of books and learning courses. If you, yeah. if you, if your motivation isn't there, then you're not going to learn the language. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's kind of like if you think you won't succeed, there's pretty much no way you will. Like it's not going to just happen magically. But um, yeah, earlier when you were talking about how people say they're tone deaf so they can't learn tones. I thought about how like, so I'm a native Chinese speaker and I have some like Chinese speaking friends who are tone deaf, but so it's like clearly there, it's not connected at all. You can speak fluent, you can native, be native level in Chinese, but be completely tone deaf. But, of course. Um, yeah. But um, you're, you're actually still learning uh, Mandarin right now, right? Yes. So I've just reactivated my Mandarin. Like before this, I had an italki lesson. Um, and it's it's one of the more successful uh, brief projects that I had because at the end of it, I, di I didn't reach uh, high, like B2 level fluency, but I did reach B1 level conversational. And this was um, evaluated independently by a, a Chinese school in, in Beijing when I visited. And uh, it meant that when I traveled through China, I have some experiences that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life, that I I got taught Kung Fu by this Kung Fu master in a village. And I got to uh, flirt with this really cute girl on on a train, like outside of Xi'an and like all these random things. Ultimate that motivation. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all these random things that just like completely enriched my experience that I would never have had if I only spoke English or if my Mandarin was at a much lower level. And um, I've really, I had so much fun. So I'm reactivating it now because essentially I started traveling in 2003. I met this lady and she kind of threw me off my routine a lot. And for several years, I wasn't actively learning language languages. I went through a lot of personal struggles, financial problems, depression. And now I'm coming out of all of that and I'm getting back into 
um, next summer when my lease ends in this house and going back into full time travels like all the time where everything I own in the world has to weigh less than 23 kilograms so I can check it in with me and um, it's gonna it's why I'm like feeling that motivation again and like two years ago I was not in a place where I could reactivate my Mandarin because I was in a very low place in my life and there was just there's no no amount of methods or discussions that were going to work to get me out of that lull so for for some people it really uh, i i appreciate when for some people language learning actually helps them to get out of that lull it gives them that inspiration it ha- helps them to think outside of their um the, the the box that they may be trapped in that they see things from the outside world and they get inspired for when someday they may move to Japan. So that can actually help a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I'm actively learning Mandarin. And part of the reason is that I've actually co-written a book based on my experience with the people um, or the, my experience when I learned Mandarin. Um, a professor of Chinese helped me write this language hacking wow. Mandarin. So this has just been published. This is what I looked like before the stress of New York. So that, you know, the double chin has kind of come in since this image. But uh, that takes the the concepts of this is not going to get you fluent in Mandarin. It's going to get you speaking Mandarin to that basic conversational level. And this is because this book's just been published. I'm going to be doing a book tour. I obviously want to be able to talk to people who come to that book tour in Mandarin. So I'm getting I'm working intensively to get my level back to where it was when I stopped learning Mandarin uh, like seven years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm taking like three or four lessons a week with teachers. And uh, it's amazing how quickly it starts to come back. You kind of mentioned consistency, I guess, in terms of that you, I guess when you weren't in the zone for le- learning, or I guess learning any language, you weren't doing any l- learning at all, right? And I mean, from the from the guests that we've had on the podcast, we've seen that a lot of their success has just come down to very small bits of language learning every day, compounded over time, and shown how important that is. So, how how important would you say, in your opinion, those small bits every single day matter? So, I'm I'm going to give a little bit of a controversial answer to this. I think everyone you've had on before that what they say is absolutely valid and that that's important for a lot of people to do something small every day and i i'm friends with james clear who's written atomic habits and that's the same kind of principle the little things you do every day add up Uh, so that that is absolutely true now in my case it's a little bit different i have adhd so i have these attention issues where if i don't have um a true goal and a true project that is pushing me with a language, I'm not necessarily going to be able to get a lot of benefit out of doing a little bit every day. I need to have uh, something I'm working towards. And uh, more recently with some of my languages, I've been like trying to make TikToks in those languages. And that's kind of motivated me to like research a lot of the uh, like uh, upcoming cultural uh, and like trending topics that are happening in different countries and that's really helped me, but that's a bigger thing than a five minutes a day. And I think, like, I, I'm a little cynical about a lot of things. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people would use an app like Duolingo for five minutes a day. And they think that that counts for something. And nothing against Duolingo in particular, but I, I don't think using an app like that briefly over the long time is going to make that big of a difference. It may you know keep something on life support it, that you're getting it's definitely better than nothing that you're getting some exposure but like uh it depends on the person and so many people listening to this maybe they have a completely different way of approaching things but the whole reason that i have a whole fluent in three months brand is because i need to do things intensively this is how i've transformed languages in my life and i i need to have something that's pushing me with that language so i have to put several hours a day into something um now having said that like a a year ago i did try to start reactivating some languages in my life and i did do little pieces of something a day and it was definitely better than nothing to to get me feeling like you know I'm, i'm starting to use this language in some form 
but I would be a little skeptical of that in in terms of long term results. I think it's it is better if you have a true project and you're giving considerable time, at least an hour a day, uh, where you might have to make sacrifices and you might have to give up your Netflix shows in English. If you're socializing a lot in your native language, you may have to decide. Well, maybe I'm only going to socialize once a week. So that the time opens up, that I, I now have these evenings I can put into language learning, and it needs to be a priority for you to make a lot of progress. The great thing is, when you you've made enough progress, it can just be a natural part of your life. Like I said, you learn to read, and then you read to learn. And now with my Spanish, I don't have any kind of um, like learning that feels like a learning experience with Spanish. But I'm still genuinely actively using Spanish in very regular ways. Like I currently live in Texas. There's a lot of Spanish speaking immigrants and I hang out with them. I'm making content on other platforms in Spanish. I'm absorbing their content. I'm reading the news, the newspaper in Spanish. There's a lot of things that are just made it natural part of my life. The things I would do anyway. And like, you know, as I was saying at the start, I'm I'm a techie kind of guy. And if I want to edit a video and I run into a problem in After Effects, I will search on YouTube in Spanish. How do I solve this problem that, you know, it's crashing or something, it's giving a, a blank frame or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'll try to search for that in Spanish, watch the tutorial in Spanish, and then it's truly a part of my life. And that changes the whole experience. And this is why, like, I, I'm, a, I'm skeptical of this, you know, five minutes on um, uh, swiping through an app to to say like you know I've done something I think it, it has merit and if that's all you have the motivation to do now then do that and that will hopefully get you started I think that's the same as like if people say you want to get in shape the first step is just you know I'll put on my gym clothes at the start of the day there's something to be said for that that gets you started even if you're not actually like exercising that day but you're you're getting over that initial hump that maybe you can get in a routine where you're actually going to the gym or going for a run or something and that's why i think like if these open the floodgates that's great but for me personally i i don't really get that much benefit out of little five minute chunks of doing something in a language I actually right. say that's consistent with what our guests have done because i guess for some clarity they actually go and immerse for like three four hours a day and then have like an hour of reviews so i, I guess the little bit every day is a lot compared to duolingo for example we actually did a calculation for if you were to do five minutes every day how long would it take to get fluent in the language given the the um i think we we searched up that it would take five thousand hours for japanese so we use that benchmark it would take 165 years, five minutes a day. <laughs> and I, I would argue that it would, it, you, after 165 years, you definitely would not be fluent. This is the, like the bike analogy. Mm. You could study all the aerodynamics. If you've yeah. never actually tried to speak the language, if you've never put your ass on a saddle and fallen off, because that's what happens yeah. when we learn to ride a bike, then, uh, you know, I, I, so I would argue it's more than 165 <laughs> years. That'd be disappointing for for that guy <laughs> oh, we have that one 165 year old watching the video just has the tear shedding down their face right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, apologies but it may, maybe go a little bit harder maybe go a little bit harder yeah 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 but um yeah but benny earlier you were talking about how like a couple years ago you had a like a personal low point and you also made a video pretty recently about like your personal growth of how you were able to like grow past that so can you share like that, like kind of journey uh, to our audience? Yeah. So essentially I had a lot of stuff happen to me in a very short time. I got divorced. I got uh, over $80,000 in personal debt. I got even in more debt with my company. Um, I was extremely exhausted because in writing my original language hacking courses, I had 20 hour days where I was barely sleeping. Um, so I was completely burnt out from work and I ended up being clinically depressed because of all of this. Like I had to take depression medicine, which um, had mixed results and it's it was just the lowest point in my life. And it's when you're that low, it can just feel like getting anywhere is like climbing a mountain because 
I had multiple problems that I had to solve. And like like many people would have said before, if you want to climb a mountain, you just have to do it one step at a time. And that's that's essentially what I worked on is can I get to a place where I I, I had all these huge problems and I tried to just take them one at a time financially can i get on top of my finances i watched a lot of youtube videos about financial management and i changed a lot of things i moved away from new york which was very expensive i started having a cheaper life and that that was its own process and i focused on that and then next was to improve my spirits and that was its own separate challenge so like each one of these i've given them their own time and I've had to accept in this experience that like, even though being a polyglot is so central to my personality these days, it's my online brand. I'm genuinely passionate about using other languages, may not be passionate about learning languages, but I'm really, truly passionate about using languages and getting to know other cultures. So it was a hard pill for me to swallow that, do you know what, for the short term, I can't be that person. And if anyone's listening and they're going through a rough time in their life, and maybe they're finding that learning Japanese is not in not helping them get out of that rut. I would even say maybe now is not the time to be learning Japanese. Maybe you have to learn, uh, you have to work on your own personal issues in other ways, make them the priority. And this would mean that when you come back, even if it's a whole year from now, a year feels like such a long way off. But when we all think about how this pandemic has impacted us, that like the time has flown. And this, this has been one of the things for me that I have implemented things like Atomic Habits to, to make small adjustments to my finances, small adjustments to my 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 um, personal health, my mental health, and uh, to get to a better place in my life. And they have built up over time that every day I'm trying to be 1% better. And that has kind of uh, exponentially improved that now I'm feeling like I have I have this drive that I used to have uh, before uh, all these very difficult years for me, and I've got that language language passion back. So um, I, you know, I'm hoping just the fact that this is so central to my life that if I like give people permission that it's okay if you're going through a struggle and you can't be a polyglot, you can't be that Japanese speaker right now. It does not mean you'll never be that speaker. Maybe it means in the short term, you need to work to get to yourself to a better place and then you'll have the energy because especially the level of language learning that I do, the level of intensity, it requires energy. It requires motivation. And I was all out of that for several years. So I had to accept I don't have what it takes to be a language learner right now, but that's okay. I'm going to work on myself. And then I can get back to that place maybe a little bit later. It took me several years and I'm glad I made that investment. Yeah, wow. I mean, first of all, I'm really glad that you got out of that. I mean, it's better for not just you, but the entire community who has kind of been around you this entire time. So uh, on behalf of all of them, we're glad you're back. (laughs) And I I guess you kind of shared some insights that not only you got from that entire process, but from your kind of insights that you got onto language learning itself that from that being in that position. And I, I guess kind of going off that as well, would you say that you've kind of seen your your motivation in language learning in a, a new light as well? Because you mentioned that you like having that pressure to kind of push you to go and learn the language. And right now you have the book coming out um, and that, that, of course, is a great motivator to go and learn um, um, brush up on your Mandarin. But would you say there's maybe other motivators that are kind of bringing you up there as well after this experience? Absolutely, because I'm I'm going to be back into full time travels. And this is this is who I'm meant to be. I'm I'm supposed to be on the road. This is how I found the best balance in my life and how I've created the most memories for myself. And it has its own challenges, but because I'm going to be traveling, I'm not going to be in an English speaking country the majority of the time, like I have been in recent years. So this means returning to Taiwan and returning to mainland China and having a project where I really try to kick my Japanese up to that fluent level and and hopefully beyond. Those are realistic now for me. 
and you know recently i've i've already i've got like all these projects even in the short term like i've decided i i was going to be at an event uh, that actually speaks esperanto if you guys have ever come across that language i was going to be at an event for new years and um unfortunately that fell through because of mr rona uh decided to cancel uh, everything in germany so i'm going to go to mallorca uh for a few weeks so that's that's given me inspiration i'm going to relearn my catalan because uh, i learned catalan while i was in barcelona i'm going to push it up a notch and i'll actually still get to practice my i was going to go to germany but uh, they call Mallorca the like 17th district of of uh, Germany or whatever it is. So um, I'll actually get to practice my German again. And those are real world things that, you know, rather than theoretically someday I might use these languages. I have these real ro- world motivators and I really do look forward to when I can get back on the road again and I'll have these upcoming travels and they will help to drive me because there's still so much for me to discover and and explore in countries like uh like uh, china definitely japan because I, I had a very touristy experience there which is very different to so many experiences i've had in other countries so i i i, I really want to to truly experience japan uh, the same way i have other countries so it is definitely on my short list within the next years that i'll get back there and uh you can bet before i go that'll be my big motivator that I'll be intensively relearning Japanese. Nice. Yeah, um, I'm actually from Taiwan originally, so yeah, I'm really excited to follow your journey if you make videos about about your travels. Love to hear it, especially as for people who are kind of interested in that as as the borders start opening up because I know a lot of people especially during the got a whole interest in learning a new language and going out there and traveling so kind of hearing that is is great and hopefully they can follow you along your your journey as well as your journeys as well to kind of see what they can do moving forward in this new world like you mentioned here but i think after hearing about i think i mean it's been an inspirational conversation so far especially hearing how far you've come as well as what was successful for you what wasn't and it kind of comes down over here at the Korekata podcast where we have the message to the listeners in the end where after going full circle it comes back to them you can drop the I mean I think honestly I think you've dropped so many words of wisdom already but in terms of a message to everyone here listening what would you maybe say to them I would say mistakes are your friend whether that be in ways that you could expand your social circle in the language that you have to make mistakes or if you're just doing the core learning of the language and potentially speaking with people mistakes are good i would say if you have an inner perfectionist try to work around that try to have a goal of something like i said i'm gonna make 200 mistakes today because that's how you're going to make progress the the world is imperfect as you said i'm an engineer I look at the Pareto principle. What can I get out of the 20%? And that involves me embracing the fact that it is not going to sound that good. But this is just a part of the process. Does not mean that, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks and that your mistakes are going to be fossilized into you forever. It just means that right now, right now, mistakes are what you need to make. And eventually you will have um, you will have a place in in the language will have a place in your life where those mistakes won't be as central anymore. So get out there and make mistakes. Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. Hope you enjoyed that conversation as well. Uh, let us know in the comments if you learned anything new and what you thought of Benny's personal journey. But but we're just gonna quickly thank our patrons for Raz, Brit versus Japan, Kevin. Quaid, Alan, Jack, Yuri, DH90, Sad Boy. Uh, there's a new one. <laughs> there's a new guy. How you do KH90 like that, man? Alan Card. Is that it? <laughs> I don't know who I'm missing. Um, Cedric, Alan, Jonathan, Faraz, Alan Card, Brit Rich, and Quaid, KH90, Drew, Jack, Yuri, Sad Boy. All right, see you guys in the next one.